So our first session this morning is going to uh, discuss new and novel targets. Our first speaker is Robert Cop uh, Copeland from Epizyme, and he's going to talk on histone methyl transferases as a target class for drug discovery. Robert. Thank you very much. It's quite an honor to present to this audience, and thank you, Bruce, for the uh, invitation. I want to tell you today about some of the work that's going on at Epizyme, focused on uh, defining small molecule inhibitors for a class and a relatively novel class of enzymes, the histone methyl transferases for oncology indications. This is one of the things you'll learn today, that we are treating these enzymes not only as individual targets, but also as a target class and how we're getting some efficiencies in drug discovery out of that. I also need to point out that some of the work that I'll be presenting today on EZH2 is in press uh, in PNAS and so is subject to the embargo policy of PNAS. So what we're really focused on is the uh, control of gene transcription and particularly the aberrant gene transcription that is associated with many forms of malignancy. Um, as everyone in this audience knows, that if we were to blow up a chromosome and look in detail, we see this uh, pattern of staining of uh, alternating dense and light regions, which translates into different regions of condensation of the chromatin. Turns out that in large part, what controls gene transcription is the level of packing or condensation of chromatin between what um, is viewed as a two-state model. It's more complicated than that, but for our purposes today, we can view this as chromatin existing in either a transcriptionally repressive conformation or a more open, uh, less condensed, transcriptionally permissive uh, conformation. What determines that conformational transition is uh, the level of methylation of the DNA itself, but very importantly, levels of post-translational modifications of the histone proteins around which the chromosomal DNA is wound. Those post-translational modifications uh, are summarized here. They include a variety of different covalent bond formations, all of which are catalyzed by different classes of enzymes. So uh, the, uh, the enzymes that remove acetyl groups, the HDACs, are well known to this audience, but there are other enzymes that put acetyl groups on lysines, that ubiqu ubiquinate uh, lysines, phosphorylation of serines, and what uh, we are focused on at Epizyme, and what I'll talk about today are the enzymes that perform methylation at specific arginine or lysine residues. These are referred to as protein or histone, arginine methyltransferases, or lysine methyltransferases, and collectively we refer to these as the histone methyltransferases or HMTs. There's another class of enzymes which remove those methyl groups. And so there is an equilibrium here. We at Epizyme have chosen to focus exclusively on the histone methyl transferases. That was a strategic decision, in part based on resource limitations, but also because this turns out to be a very large family of enzymes, as I'll show you in a moment, a very druggable uh, class of enzymes, and a class of enzymes for which there is good uh, association in a causal way with different forms of cancer. So when we first got started about two years ago, one of the first questions we asked was how many of these enzymes are there in the human genome and what is their chemical biological relatedness to one another? Surprisingly, there wasn't a good answer to that question. So we performed a systematic uh, survey of the human genome, and what we found was that there were almost 100 of these enzymes, 96 to be precise. They break into two classes of enzymes uh, based on their biochemical specificity, the lysine and the arginine methyltransferases, 
with one exception, DOT1 is biochemically a lysine methyltransferase, but from a crystallographic, from an amino acid sequence, and from a pharmacological perspective, DOT1 actually fits better with the arginine methyltransferases. Like the kinases, the HMTs represent a large family of enzymes that perform their activity on a diversity of macromolecular substrates, but do so utilizing a common small molecule cofactor. In the case of the kinases, ATP. In the case of the HMTs, it's s methionine or SAM, as we abbreviate it. And so this gives us a locus for pharmacological intervention. Of these uh, 96 enzymes, we have identified three which have really exquisite target validation in terms of uh, a causal role in specific cancers, and we're focused on those as uh, drug-seeking targets. Uh, but we have also identified proprietary biochemical methods that allow us to universally screen for any HMT that we wish to. And I'll mention a little more about that at the end of my talk. I want to tell you about two projects that we have going on, DOT1L and EZH2. DOT1L is uh, a lysine methyltransferase that is causally involved in mixed lineage leukemia. And essentially 100% of patients with mixed lineage leukemia, there's a translocation of the MLL gene. MLL is normally a lysine methyltransferase itself. It methylates histone H3 on lysine 4. But in the context of the translocation, the active site of MLL is lost. There's a fusion to a variety of different AF or ENL proteins. And in the context of that fusion, DOT1L is aberrantly uh, recruited to different gene locations where it catalyzes the methylation of lysine 79. Our expectation then is that in cells that contain the MLL translocation, a DOT1 inhibitor would be cytotoxic. And in cells that do not contain the translocation, a DOT1L inhibitor would not have an antiproliferative effect. This summarizes very quickly the characteristics of our lead compounds. They're potent selective inhibitors with good pharmacological properties. Uh, we have been using crystallography to really drive lead optimization. And this summarizes in biochemical terms where we are. We have compounds that show beautiful dose-dependent inhibition of the enzyme. They are competitive with SAM, non-competitive with uh, the nucleosome uh, substrate. They are tight binding, and yes, Bruce, they are slow dissociating inhibitors uh, with potencies below 100 picomolar, uh, with really exquisite selectivity. Uh, for most of the other HMTs, the IC50 is greater than 50 micromolar. One exception, an RMT has a IC50 in excess of 500 nanomolar, so greater than 500-fold selectivity. These compounds get into cells and in a dose-dependent way block the H3K79 methyl mark. They do so only on the H3K79 methyl mark, uh, none of the other methyl marks of the uh, histones. And so the biochemical selectivity is recapitulated in the cellular selectivity. This diminution in methyl mark translates into an uh, antiproliferative effect, but that antiproliferative effect, as expected, only occurs in cells that contain the MLL rearrangement. So uh, we see very um, robust concentration-dependent inhibition of proliferation and driving the cells into apoptosis for uh, cell lines that contain the MLL rearrangement, but no effect on proliferation for non-rearranged cells, despite the fact that the compound gets in and affects the methyl mark. And uh, we have seen this in a variety of different MLL rearranged cell lines and non-rearranged cell lines. That selectivity of cell killing uh, holds up very nicely. 
we see beautiful correlation between inhibiting the enzyme, inhibiting intramolecular methylation and cell proliferation. And most recently, we've taken a compound in vivo. This compound had very poor pharmacokinetic properties, and so we did this through a mini pump where we could get continuous uh, exposure. Um, and we overshot. So we did two doses, a low dose and a high dose, uh, for 6-day six coverage and 14-day coverage. And at all of those doses for all that duration, we wiped out the methyl mark to the level uh, of the ceiling of our um, ELISA assay, with one exception. There was one uh, animal in the low-dose six-day group that seemed to be an anomaly. Turned out the pump failed in that animal, and no compound was delivered to systemic circulation. So let me turn my attention now to EZH2, another lysine methyltransferase. EZH2 is the uh, catalytic uh, subunit of a four-protein complex referred to as polycomb repressor complex. Um, the job of this uh, complex is to methylate histone H3 on lysine K27. The complex is responsible for monomethylation, dimethylation, and trimethylation. And it appears that the trimethyl form of uh, K27 is what is tumorigenic. There was a paper uh, that came out in January of this year that sort of uh, gave us a little pause in terms of the validity of EZH2 as a cancer target because what these workers reported was that in about 10 percent of uh, subsets of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, follicular and um, uh, the diffused large B cell uh, lymphomas, um, there was a point mutation in EZH2, always at tyrosine 641, to a variety of different amino acids. And in vitro, when they uh, made the polycomb repressor 2 complex with the mutant uh, EZH2, they found that there was no catalytic activity while there was a robust activity for the wild type enzyme, and they concluded that these uh, mutants were loss of function mutations. A couple of things about this were problematic from an enzymology perspective. First of all, all of the patients that were identified with this mutation were heterozygous. So they had one copy of the wild type enzyme, one copy of the mutant enzyme. That doesn't quite make sense in terms of catalytic activity. Um, the other thing is that it's very unusual to see loss of function so exquisitely selective with a single amino acid. So we decided to look at this in greater detail. And the first thing we did was to take the mutant enzymes and look at them against a peptide substrate, and we got exactly the same results as, as what was published. Wild type enzyme was active, all the mutants were essentially dead. We then did this against the physiological substrate, the, the whole nucleosome. We got a very different answer. Now all of the mutants are as active as the wild type or more active. So why is this so? There are a number of uh, explanations for this, but what we found is that the mutation is actually changing the substrate specificity of the enzyme. So if we look at uh, activity against an unmethylated peptide, we see that the wild type has robust activity. This phenylalanine mutant has a little hint of activity. All the others are dead. If we look at a peptide that is monomethylated on 27, now the mutants start to show some activity. And a dimethylated uh, uh, peptide at K27 shows robust activity for the mutants, whereas the wild type is almost dead. And so what you're seeing is a situation where the substrate specificity has changed based on methylation status. What this also means is that you require heterozygosity for disease here because you need the wild type enzyme to put the first methyl group on, and then you need the mutant to drive accelerated uh, dye and trimethylation. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first example of a human disease that is dependent on heterozygosity and coupling of enzyme uh, uh, activities. 
I'm not going to bore you with a lot of studies, say, kinetics, except to say that the difference in substrate specificity is all within the transition state, not within the ground state. Uh, and this gives us some avenues for selective drug discovery. It also allows us to take the KCAT and KM values, all that, that biochemistry that you tried so hard to forget as first year medical students, uh, to take those values and to um, uh, um, derive an equation that would allow us to predict the levels of monodye and trimethylation in cells. Here are the results of those simulations. What we see, the pattern we see is that trimethylation would be up in the heterozygous mutant cells relative to wild type, dimethylation down, and monomethylation down. When we grew cells that were wild type or mutant, we got exactly the pattern that we expected based on the steady state kinetic uh, simulations. So where are we in terms of drug discovery? Uh, like uh, dot one, we have potent and selective compounds. This slide is a little out of date. We're down to about 20 nanomolar compounds that get into cells uh, and um, selectively inhibit the H3 K27 mark with no effect on any of the other histone methyl marks. Uh, our compounds, and this is a dated slide as well, we have more potent compounds now, but the take home message from this slide is that our compounds hit both the wild type and the mutant enzyme. And um, although we are focused on three of the 96 enzymes as drug-seeking efforts, there's a very large target pool here that we can work in. And of these 96, we have defined 20 which have good validation in terms of association with cancer. So how can we exploit in an effective way this large target pool? We're using a process that we refer to as cross-screening. I mentioned to you that we have identified some proprietary biochemical uh, methodologies by which we can screen any of these enzymes in a biochemical assay and look at the effect of inhibitors. And so what we've done is we've started to array these enzymes. At the time that this slide was made, we had eight enzymes in our cross-screening panel. Today, that number is 11. By the time I get back to the office, it'll probably be about 15. And by the end of the year, we expect to have all 20 of the well-validated targets in our cross-screening panel. The idea is that for our three drug-seeking efforts, we're going through traditional drug discovery methods. We're using high-throughput screening. We're using de novo design. We're using uh, structure-guided design and what we refer to as mechanism-guided design to identify inhibitors uh, of these uh, enzymes and to design analogs of those inhibitors. We take all of that chemical matter and we develop from it an HMT-biased library of small molecule inhibitors. Today, that library is about 3,000 compounds, which represents a diversity of chemical structures, a diversity of inhibition modalities, uh, a, a, a quite rich library, and a growing library. So today, 3,000 compounds. By the end of the year, uh, that will probably be around 5,000 compounds, and it will continue to grow um, uh, from there. The idea, pretty obvious, um, we take that library and then we use it to interrogate all of these other HMTs. That does several things for us. First of all, it informs us on the selectivity of our compounds for our uh, drug-seeking efforts, but it also gives us the opportunity to identify starting point molecules, tool compounds, or even program start molecules against a richness of other HMTs. And indeed, HMT3 started as a program because of the interesting chemical matter that was identified in our cross-screening panel that came along simultaneously with literature that suggested a strong role for this enzyme in a particular type of hematologic uh, cancer. You can see um, a little hint here that we are being quite successful in this cross-screening methodology 
And what I can tell you is of the 11 enzymes that are in our cross-screening panel today, we have identified potent selective inhibitors with divergent SAR against every single one of those enzymes. That was a bit of a surprise. When we first suggested this strategy to Bruce and the other members of the SAB and our board, we said it would probably take us about two or three years to develop the technology, to develop the library, and to start to uh, bear fruit from this type of method. We were absolutely wrong about those kinetics. It actually took us less than six months to realize that. So where we are today is that we have uh, a series of potent and selective DOT1 inhibitors. Uh, we are optimizing the pharmacokinetic properties of these compounds and expect to be in animal efficacy studies and uh, at the clinical candidate stage by the middle of next year. EZH2 is a little bit behind but is uh, really uh, rapidly accelerating. And so uh, we also expect to be at the candidate selection phase by the middle of next year. HMT3 is our newest drug-seeking effort. We started that project in January of this year. We're already down to single-digit micromolar. That may not sound very impressive, but let me remind you that DOT1 and EZH2 started with 20 micromolar hits. Um, and so uh, we believe that we can drive this potency down very rapidly. In terms of the cross-screening, again, this slide is a little bit dated. It's not complete, but, but nevertheless, it makes the point that we have quite potent selective inhibitors of all of the HMTs in our cross-screening panel. And again, these are demonstrating divergent SIR. What I mean by that is that we have unique inhibitors for each of those enzymes. It's not the same group of compounds hitting every enzyme. So we believe this will continue to be a very productive way to identify small molecule inhibitors of HMTs, uh, with the ultimate goal, of course, of bringing these into the clinic uh, as a, a novel modality for um, a cancer treatment. So uh, with the couple of minutes that I have left, let me just uh, thank uh, the members of R&D at Epizyme. Uh, Robert Gould is our CEO. He comes to us uh, from the Broad Institute and before that, 23 years at Merck. Uh, Mike Moyer is our VP of Molecular Discovery. Mike was the chemist uh, behind Tarsiva and uh, spent a long career at Pfizer and then uh, a brief period at the Broad before joining uh, Epizyme. Vicky Rishan, uh, was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, and then uh, was a co-founder of Aton, which brought the first HDAC inhibitor to FDA approval. She then uh, migrated with the compound to Merck, and then from Merck joined um, uh, Epizyme uh, at uh, uh, about two years ago, about the same time that I joined. Uh, very talented group of people. The senior management of this group collectively has brought 58 compounds to IND and has seven marketed drugs among us. And so I think we're in a very strong position to realize the translation of the basic science of epigenetics and histone methyltransferases to uh, clinical candidates. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, questions? We'll take questions now, Robert. So, Robert, maybe I'll start off by asking you about this codependency in terms of the heterozygous state. I mean, are there particular mutants that seem to drive that codependency? So, um, what has been identified is uh, several mutations. Uh, the most uh, prevalent is a tyrosine to phenylalanine mutation but there's also histidine, asparagine, uh, and serine mutations, less prevalent, but all with the same phenotypic type of effects. The enzymology is consistent with that. Uh, 
more recently, a, a tyrosine to cysteine mutation was identified in a subset of uh, myelodysplastic syndrome uh, patients. Uh, we haven't published on that, but we have the data, and it's the same story. The cysteine, the tyrosine to cysteine mutation uh, diminishes monomethylation capability, increases dye and trot. Interesting. Other questions? Charlie? complex genetics and epigenetics? Yes, the question uh, was uh, what's our patient selection strategy. Having identified uh, the mutations, uh, we are going, our first clinical indication is going to be in a subset of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and we'll use the, um, uh, the, uh, the presence of those mutations as a patient stratification uh, mechanism. Now, EZH2 has implications in a wide number of solid tumors as well as hematologic tumors. For a small company like us, it makes sense to do a very focused patient stratification um, uh, plan, and so that's what we're doing. Uh, if we uh, get approval through that route, then we can expand into other indications. David? Yeah, is there a structural, structural bit, is there structural evidence to underscore the lovely finding that the tyrosine mutant form of ECH2 can effectively add a methyl group to the dimethyl peptide or the dimethylated protein, but not the monomethylated or the non-methylated guy? I, I wish the answer to that question was yes, it is not, because uh, ECH2 is part of a four-protein complex. There's no enzymatic activity in the absence of the other subunits, and so we are trying right now to crystallize that four protein subunit. We've had some modest success with getting small crystals, uh, but nothing large enough for diffraction. What if, you model well, the, what if you model the active center of ECH2? Yes, exactly. So there are a number of proteins that are related to ECH2 uh, where the, um, the tyrosine mutation has been made. Uh, it doesn't occur in nature, but it's been made um, through the tools of molecular biology. And it looks like this is a steric effect, that when you have the, the tyrosine there, um, that uh, there's too much steric crowding to permit the dimethylation and trimethylation without a rotation around the, the nitrogen-carbon bond of the lysine. When you remove the hydroxyl group from the tyrosine, or if you remove the aromatic group altogether, you now open up a lot of steric space where you could get multiple methylations. That explains the preference for di and trimethylation. It doesn't completely explain the diminution of the monomethylation. We don't have a good explanation for that. Chris, did you? Yeah. Uh, Bob, I, I don't remember this but it would be important to have an animal model of the, uh, the lymphoma uh, mutation. Is there such a thing uh, underway now, or yes, has there, it been done? Yeah, it turns out that the cells that bear the uh, mutations, um, the tyrosine, the phenylalanine mutation, and another, I believe it's the asparagine, uh, those are cells for which xenografts have previously been established, and uh, not surprisingly, we're doing that right now.